Are you ready? Go. Let's go. From AMI Central. Now circling in the neutral zone. Here's the pitch on the way. 36 yards for the win. This. Here comes a big chance. The shot is, is Chris the Tiger. The neutral zone. Oh, it's oh my God. This is as good as it gets. Now, here's your host, two-time Paralympian, Rock Richardson. What's going on? It's time for another edition of The Neutral Zone. I am indeed your host, Brock Richardson, and I am alongside Cam Jenkins for today. I'm going to tell you what's coming up on the show. Coming up on today's show, we release the second interview we did at the Canadian Paralympic Committee Summit. This time we hear from wheelchair rugby player Anthony Latineau from Quebec. Plus, we chat about the Toronto Raptors being eliminated by the Chicago Bulls in the upcoming NHL playoffs. And with that, we're going to get into this week's headlines. Neutral Zone Headlines. Headlines. We kick things off in the para-sports community. Wheelchair Basketball Canada is excited to announce the appointment of Marnie Abbott-Peter as the head coach of the senior women's national te- team. The Vancouver, BC native takes on the head coaching role as the Canadian women prepare for the IWBF World Championships, which runs June 9th to the 20th, and also the Parapan American Games, which runs from November 17th to the 26th. And staying in the world of wheelchair basketball, the senior men's national team took home the bronze medal in the Easter tournament with a 49-45 victory over Turkey. Congratulations to both programs. And we're going to take a look at the 2023 Women's World Hockey Championships as they concluded. Here are your final results. USA wins gold in a 6-3 final against the Team Canada. Plus, then Team Canada wins silver and Czechia wins the bronze. Staying in the world of hockey, the Pittsburgh Penguins will not make the playoffs for the first time in 16 seasons as they held the record in the four major sports with this number. And it's unfortunate to see that the Pittsburgh Penguins and Sidney Crosby will not make it, but them's the breaks. And more history was made this week with the home of the Toronto Blue Jays and the Rogers Centre. In just the second home game of the season on April 12th of this year, the Rogers Centre roof was open, making this the earliest the roof has ever been opened in franchise history. Those are your headlines for this week. And as we do at this point in the program, we chat a little bit about a topic that has happened in the world of sports. Today we feature an umpire who was struck in the head during a baseball game as a throw was going to home. Let's listen to this clip for a little more context. Major League Baseball umpire Larry Vanover was released from the hospital Friday, two days after being hit in the head with a relay throw by a Guardians player during a game against the New York Yankees in Cleveland. Vanover was discharged from the Cleveland Clinic after being under care for two nights and will remain off the field until he's cleared by MLB's medical personnel. The 67-year-old was struck on the left side of his head in the fifth inning Wednesday by a throw from Guardians All-Star second baseman Andres Jimenez, who was firing toward home plate on the play i'm geffen Coolbaugh. so for me when i listen to this clip i just want to add a little bit more context that that clip did not give the umpires on first base second base and third base wear nothing more than a baseball cap on their head signifying the mlb uh symbol on the front of it uh, Cameron, I think for me, the question that I have for you is because of an incident like this, should umpires be wearing more than just a baseball cap on the basis or is it just a one-off incident? I definitely think that they should be doing that um, to have some sort of protective headwear. Um, and if they aren't, I, I don't know if the, um, you know, the umpires that are along the base paths, if they have some sort of a chest protector um, or if they're wearing, um, you know, knee protectors or leg protectors. Um, I think that uh, if they're not, they should be wearing that and they definitely wear ball caps and they need to wear some sort of a a helmet. Um, You know, John Olrude, uh, famously the first baseman for the Toronto Blue Jays, he wore a helmet 
and um, because of surgery that he had. And, um, so I, I don't see why the umpires uh, shouldn't be wearing that. No, and I'm not 100% sure either as to whether they're wearing uh, chest protectors or anything underneath their shirt. And the reason being is because we don't see that. And I don't expect umpires to stand there and lift their shirt up and, you know, show us every time we we get a game, obviously. Uh, But the fact is, I agree. I think that uh, they should be wearing more. And I, I can hear the argument to a point, Cameron, of like, well, this only happens as a one off. But that one off could hit somebody in a real dangerous spot and it could really cost them you know their life or the ability to to you know have the life that they do currently you know if it hits them in the temple who knows what that might do so i i can understand the argument cameron of the one-off but i don't buy it yeah no uh whether it's a one-off or not uh when something happens like that uh, you've got to be proactive and you have to um you know make changes and because like you said, it it's only going to take one where, you know, someone gets uh, boinked off the head or uh, a ball gets hit really hard and the umpire can't react quick enough and it might hit them in the chest and then, you know, heart attack or who knows what could happen, right? So um, they definitely have to do it. And that's how, you know, change is made is when something happens like that and it's a one-off or it seems to be a one-off, but change needs to be uh Definitely needs to happen. Sure. And I mean, you look at in baseball, the um, down the first and third base line, they now have netting uh, that that protects the crowd to a point. Yeah. And this is because, you know, one off incidences have taken place and have really hurt somebody. And to me, Mm -hmm. you know, the umpires are in a very vulnerable position uh, when they're on the, the base paths and there was a situation uh, last week where uh, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. was leading a ball uh, towards first base when the pitcher was to get it. And he and the umpire collided, and the umpire, you know, hit the deck and got up and made the call, made the correct call, I, I may add. But, uh, you know, these are all incidences that can happen, and they aren't just supposed to be projected as, oh, they're just, they're just a part of the field of play. They are human beings as well. In hockey recently, we've seen a goaltender go down and fall backwards and hit their head. And that could easily happen on the play of field uh, in baseball as well. Saying that, yes, they may have grass or they may have astroturf, uh, but especially if it's an astroturf type, um, you know, play field, that's still really going to hurt if you fall backwards or an umpire falls backwards and hits the back of their head, in my opinion. So... I think that, uh, yeah, I I just, you want to be able to think of everything that's going to happen. And when baseball has been around for what, a hundred years, major league baseball and umpires have never worn helmets to the best of my knowledge. And I think, uh, it's time for them to wear some sort of a protective, um, helmet and there's nothing wrong with doing them. I think what sort of baffles me in all this is, you look at first base coaches, third base coaches, they are wearing helmets. Uh, and it, it oh, yeah, baff- that's a good point, too. It, yeah. it, it baffles me that umpires don't. I, You know, they're they're within about, you know, maybe three feet of each other from from one place to the other, the umpire to the base coach. And I, it just it puzzles me uh, why uh, the umpires don't wear more protective gear than what they do. Umpires at home bait home plate for obvious reasons uh wear more and they should but i don't preclude you know umpires on the basis to injury as well yeah and depending on the situation like uh the home plate umpire has a a baseball mask on so if they ended up leaving that on and the baseball like you know went towards them they may hit them in the mask so at least they're somewhat protected um and if it's going towards their head maybe they would be able to you know, move out of the way quick enough to get it to go towards their face mask. Like, like, who knows? It's just in today's day and age, you can't think of everything. And I appreciate that. However, when something happens like that, then you better darn well do something about it to protect, in this case, the umpires. And it's just protecting everybody at the end of the day. And you you can't think of everything. And, but when something happens, 
you've got to talk about it and you've got to come up with a solution and the easiest solution is for them to wear helmets of some sort absolutely if you uh want to get a hold of us on twitter here's how you can do that and welcome back to the Neutral Zone AMI broadcast booth. And we are set to get this ball game underway. The first pitch brought to you by Brock Richardson's Twitter account at Neutral Zone BR. First pitch, strike. And hey, gang, why not strike up a Twitter chat with Claire Buchanan for the Neutral Zone? Find her at Neutral Zone CB. And there's a swing and a chopper out to second base right at Claire. She picks up the ball, throws it over to first base for a routine out. And fans, there is nothing routine about connecting with Cam and Josh from the Neutral Zone. At Neutral Zone, Cam J and at J Watson 200. Now that's a winning combination. And this Oregon interlude is brought to you by AMI Audio on Twitter. Get in touch with the Neutral Zone. Type in at AMI Audio. Today we released the second interview that I did at the Canadian Paralympic Committee Summit. We speak with Anthony Letourneau from Beaubriac, Quebec. Enjoy the interview. You started wheelchair rugby within the last 10 years. Can you talk a little bit about your journey and how you've enjoyed the game, picked up the game, that kind of thing? Okay, I first picked up the game uh, actually at the hospital when I was hospitalized. Uh, one of the workers there showed me uh, what wheelchair rugby was. Like, ooh, that looked real nice. So. When I got to readaptation, I was like, hey, I want to try this. And uh, the readaptation center has contact with the Montreal team. So they sent me to the Montreal uh, practice uh, in the middle of the readaptation. I was not even done with readaptation. I already started playing. And they put me in a wheel beach, uh, rugby chair. And the, for the first practice, there's like a circle in the middle of the court. And I don't think I went off the circle because when they were pushing one end, I was just at the tip of the circle and they start pushing on the other end. So I just turn around and go on the other side and touch out the tip of the circle. I was like, ooh, it's already going on the other side. So I turn back and I'll practice during like one hour, one hour 30. And after that, I'm like, ooh, time to get back to adaptation. And my shoulder was like so much. I worked hard so much just to get one tip of the court at uh, one tip of the circle at the other that I did nothing for the two days after. It's like, ooh, I'm too tired. I'm like two days after, it's like I'm still tired. Like it's practice time again, so I better get going and I'll just keep going. And now, I'm, now after, before I know it, I was like already approached by the national team, and the national team's like, ooh, I'm getting pretty good. And I think do well, do you want to come to the training camp? I was like, yeah, sure, I can come to training camp. So I went to training camp and like, I got carded and I just keep, keep going from there. When did you recognize, like through all of that process, when did you really recognize and say, hey, wheelchair rugby can be something that I can do and do really well? Can you talk a little bit about that? Was there a moment where you really thought to yourself, this is gonna be something? At first, like, I was just trying to uh, get on the same level because at club practice, like, people were so much better than me. So I was just trying to get to the same level as them. It's like, it took me really not that long to get on the same level as them. It's like, they were playing for eight years. And, like, I'm just started, I'm, like, just, like, one year in. And I'm already getting at their level. So, like, maybe I can push it further down, man. I just keep going after one year. It's like, oh, I'm getting really good at this. Love it. You you talked about the um, recovery time, and you talked about it at your first practice, and you said, you know, this is this is hard. How have you managed the recovery time, given your disability, and how have you gotten better with, I need to do this in order to recover and be at my best? You'd be surprised how much the human body is much more capable than what we think. It's like, I was just tired and I was like, I feel like I couldn't move, but I s still went to practice after the two days. I, I still hurt my shoulder. I was like, just going to keep going because I really enjoy doing it. And like, it's like, uh, I'm from hockey. So like the, the locker room ambience and everything was like the same in rugby. I just, I just love it. So I just, I keep going there. And since I'm there, like, 
I'm gonna push my chair and just keep pushing my chair and so like after a couple of weeks like oh I'm I'm fine after one day and like after another couple of weeks like oh practice starting to get easier I should train more than just that practice so I feel like it's just the human body can recover way faster than you think and you just can do way more than you think I think I love that um you went to your first uh, Paralympic Games in uh, Tokyo. Can you talk a little bit about that? What that experience was like for you? Were you kind of like eyes wide open? Wow, this is the Paralympic Games. Can you speak to that a little bit? It was my first Paralympic game. It was like uh, at the COVID Par- Paralympic Games. So a bit uh, everything was like uh, restricted, if you say so. But even with uh, a lot of stuff restricted, it was just overwhelming there was just so much stuff going on and in and it was just i was just impressed and amazed like how the legislation went how big it was how much people there were and i just feel like i feel like paris i feel like i'm gonna feel the same thing as paris because it's gonna be the first one that's not restricted by the covid so i feel like even it's my second parapic i'm still gonna learn from a lot from Paris and it's going to be a lot different than Paris. Yeah. In your first uh, games, you scored uh, seven tries, so I learned. And uh, can you talk about how challenging it is to score seven tries? And, and a try for those out there is a, is a score in wheelchair rugby. How difficult is that? I didn't even know I, I scored seven tries. We're not counting them when we're on the court. It's just uh, maybe... It's not that it's hard, it's like maybe this game, I score seven try, but like sometimes my job is to do some spacing on top and I'm gonna be open for the goal, but it's not because I'm better than anybody else. It's like the the place that we run make me open for the goal. So it's like really a team, team effort because if I'm, if I'm just taking the ball and trying to score seven try by myself, I will not score that much. So I feel like it's just team effort that bring you to score a lot and we don't even realize how much we score. I'm pretty sure if you ask our best player in the team how much try score, uh, what it means like to Zach if he scored like 20 or 40 try in a game, he's like, you probably wouldn't care either. Yeah, no, I, I think as athletes, we, you know, don't don't care about the stats. You know, we we talk about stats in, in media because that's what we do. But I think the end result is that did you win? Did you lose? Did you what did you accomplish? And I think that's the biggest part about it. And the numbers don't necessarily matter. The question's going to be, you know, did you did you do what you needed to do and get to where you needed to get to? I did what I needed to do mostly, but I still make like a couple of rookie mistakes and I don't know if it was the pressure or if it was like the overwhelming experience of the Tokyo, but I make some mistake that would class as uncharacteristic, un- like not myself usually, would not really make those mistakes. So I was a bit disappointed in that, but aside of those small mistake, I feel like uh, I did play really well and I was getting the job done. As athletes, we have uh, teammates that we learn to grow with and we learn to love. Sometimes they're like brothers and you argue and all those kind of things. I know that uh, your teammate, uh, Shane Smith, is uh, going through some uh, difficulties with health. Can you speak to uh, what that's like and the brotherhood and how you can sort of help Shane get through what he's going through at the moment as a as a teammate. It was a hard thing to learn from uh, everybody when we learned that he had some uh, medical issue, but firstly, I, I want to say that for now he's doing a bit better. So we're all glad and we have a, because we're not centralized, we are from all over Canada. Some of us in Vancouver, I'm in Montreal-ish and uh, He's from Toronto, so we, we have a, a group chat and we're just on top of the group chat. And if you need anything else, you can speak to us. Or we can, like, we're just, we're just on top of the group chat. And when we get together, we're just on top of it too. So that's how we try to stay connected and stay as a family too.
what does your team need to do to be where they want to be at the podium going into Paris uh, 2024? That's what we're figuring right now because uh, in Tokyo and past worlds, thing didn't go like as as planned for us. We didn't finish as high as we wanted, and like the the world's one was a, like a big slap in the face because we really feel like we had a at least a podium team. And with the deception and everything, we, and because we have a bit time, we could took like that two, three months after off. And now we, now we are cracking down with the team, with team meeting, uh, trying to turn all the stone to leave none on turn and just to really try to crack down what's happening and what we can do to make it better. Because we, sadly, we don't have, uh, an answer right now because I don't think it's it's like a black and white answer. It's not a if it was that easy, we probably already figure it out and just do it. But it's just something we're trying to crack down right now too. It's easy for outside people to sit and say, "Let's do this. Let's do that." And and if you do this, then you should get the results you need. As a, as a former athlete, one of the things that I couldn't stand was when you, you get this whole thing of like, oh, this team should do this, and then you don't do that, and everyone's like, but why didn't we get there? And I think people forget that there's an internal battle that goes on in your team, and everyone's trying to do what they need to do. Can you speak to how important it is to shut off social media, not necessarily shut it off, to to ignore social media when things aren't going the way that it quote unquote should. Yeah, we. What you need first is all to be on the same page with your teammates. So, whatever the social media say and say, you need to know and be on the same page as your teammate. And if because you we've been practicing to do this thing for uh, for years together it's a it's a process and what we need when everything goes wrong is uh, to trust the process we need we need to go back to what we do for four years and trust the process and that's that's how you do it it's rely on what you've been practicing what you've been perfect in for all those years and just like you say shut it on social media just give it away you're not playing with social media on the court you're playing with your teammate and even if your teammate do something you just go with it yeah and it's true what does a day like today for you mean uh in doing this like why is it important for you to be here today and do a bunch of interviews uh it's it's important to uh i'm just trying to give back what the community give back so if i'm a like so much sponsor gave us the chance to uh, to perform at the IS level, CPC help us with finance and everything. So if I can give back a bit of my time to tell my story, maybe inspire some people here and there, I'm just happy to do it. I'm just more than happy to help. People uh, look at uh, wheelchair rugby and they say, man, there's a lot of impact and I don't know whether I want to get involved and maybe I do, um, maybe I don't. What would you say to the person that's listening to this interview and saying, should I, shouldn't I, why should they? Push them over the edge. It make a lot more noise that it actually hurts. So it's like a bumper car. A lot of noise, but you don't actually get hurt. And if you're playing at club level, people won't be like usually as fast as me or as big as me. And if we know you're new, we're gonna, take care of you too but you see well well i started playing wheelchair rugby i just become much more independent like i'm much stronger from my shoulder everything i start uh, traveling alone now like before uh, before starting sport like i i say i will never be able to travel alone i do stuff alone and now after doing sports like of course i can travel alone uh, uh, me and one of my buddy went to korea 
just to a person in a wheelchair just trolling in Korea and just having the time of their life. So I think if you start sports, you're just going to get in better shape. And if you're in better shape, you can do more thing in life. Yeah, I've, I've seen wheelchair rugby and I've been in in places where there's games. And the first thing I smell when I go in there is burning rubber. If I don't roll into the venue and smell burning rubber, does that mean that something's not going right? Like, is, is there a need for the burning rubber smell in wheelchair rugby for you guys to know where you're at? Even if you're not as competitive as you want, if you play sport, if even if it's not wheelchair rugby, if you do sport, I'm just going to be... I'm just going to be glad. I think sports is just important in general for your well-being. So just, I, I think it's just do sport. It doesn't need to smell burning rubber. It doesn't mean to like topple over like I do in my rugby chair. But I think if you just play sports, it's going to be life-changing for you. That was Anthony Letourneau. And I sat down with him at the Canadian Paralympic Committee Summit. And he's from Quebec. If you liked what you heard, Please get a hold of us by voicemail. Here's how you can do it. Hey, if you want to leave a message for the Neutral Zone, call now. 1-866-509-4545. And don't forget to give us permission to use your message on the air. Let's get ready to leave a voicemail. As we continue on in today's program, we always love getting feedback and we tell you how to get a hold of us on Twitter and then how to get a hold of us by voicemail. And this week, we got some feedback from a Twitter listener. Cameron, can you give us the details of that feedback? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of our uh, valued listener, uh, Claude Dijkstra, um, had uh, made some comments uh, in regards to the episode that we did um, a couple of weeks ago, I think now, um, about uh, anxiety and in sports. And uh, Claude had said that, uh, for me, sports has always been a microcosm of many aspects of life and a safe place to encounter and learn from adversity. Anxiety in sports maps directly to our real lives in many ways, professionally and personally. Thanks for the frank discussions. So thanks very much, Claude, for uh, your feedback and for uh, listening to us and for commenting on a very important topic uh, in regards to anxiety in sports. Here, here to that, and I echo those same sentiments that Cameron gave. We appreciate it, Claude, and we hope that you uh, continue to listen to our program. Uh, sometimes you get into discussions and you just hope that, you know, they're going to go certain ways and you hope that you're going to talk about teams moving forward and progressing in playoffs and this this uh, back half of the program is going to be playoff related but one of the topics will be the fact that the Toronto Raptors were eliminated by the Chicago Bulls um 109-103 in the 9 versus 10 game uh, in this play-in tournament that I really don't like, but I am, seem to be in the minority of this in society because everyone likes, you know, more competitive games in the late season. I get all that. Cameron, I do want to get your thoughts, but first, I just want to give you two st sort of statistics that stuck out to me, and I want to know which of them means more to you in the Toronto Raptors and what ultimately took place in them getting eliminated. So the first one is this. The Toronto Raptors' biggest lead was 19 points at one point in the game, and this, the Chicago Bulls had a lead of, wait for it, four points as their biggest lead. And the second statistic is that the Toronto Raptors missed 18 free throws. Ten of those were in the second half, including Pascal Siakam missing two of three free throws in the last couple of minutes of the game. Which of those two statistics mean to you more that they lost because of them versus the other? Oh, to me, it's the free throws. And that's why they lost the game. Like when you're in a, the playoffs or whatever you want to call what they were in, um, the playing game, uh, you know, like you've got to make your free throws. And you could probably, 
you know, half a dozen to a dozen areas where, oh, you know, Siak missed this shot or Fred Van Vliet missed this shot or, um, you know, just regular shots. Uh, but the free throws, uh, thanks to DeMar DeRozan's daughter, um, maybe that was a factor of her screaming and maybe that's why they missed a few more free sh throws than they uh, should have. But uh, when you're th when there's that many people in the... Uh, in your barn, in your uh, arena, um, somebody squealing or screaming shouldn't bother you because there's, what, 20,000, 30,000 fans in uh, the, um, I was about to call it the uh, ACC, it's no longer that, it's the Scotiabank Arena. Uh, like, th that shouldn't be a reason, but I thought that was an interesting side story that uh, DeMar DeRozan's daughter was uh, screaming, but... Yeah, it's missing the free throws because if you uh, made some of those free throws, you would have won that game. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, even if you made half of those free throws, you still ultimately uh, win the game by one or two points and uh, you, you're off and running. To me, uh, I was always taught in sports and I played bocce for those of you that might be listening for the first time. And in bocce, you are in your own uh, playing area, you are in a box, and nobody is touching you, contacting you, you are by yourself. And one of the things that I would get reminded of is that, you know, don't get too stressed out, because it's not like somebody's going to come after you and, and, you know, grab your bocce ball and throw it the other direction. And the same can be said about about uh, the free throws. I, I can understand the crowd, the, the banging sticks. I don't know if there's an actual term for those sticks, the thunder oh, yeah. sticks. Um, yeah, the thunder sticks. But I'm going to uh, – banging sticks sounds better to me. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, that, that's what we're going to go with on this edition. This is the PG program. Uh, yeah, Come on. Yeah, fair enough. The thunder sticks, um, that's fine. You see them in every arena. I, and I not for a second do I believe that you know um, the, Demar's daughter got, had anything to to do with it. I think it's an interesting side story. I wouldn't even call it interesting. It's just a side story that we all want to use and talk about and say, "Well, wow, this was this was part of it," you know, whatever. I don't agree. I'm not a fan. Whatever you missed your free throws, and it's that simple to me, in my opinion. Oh, absolutely! And like I said, you can take a look at the game. They were up 18, and yes, I know in basketball there's lots of runs, and uh, meaning that you know runs as far as getting 10 points in a row, or you know 12 points in a row, and then the other team does, and back and forth it goes. But when you're up 18, 18, and you still lose, like. I don't know. That's just horrible. And I don't know if we're going to get into it uh, later in the discussion, but, you know, there's going to be a lot of UFAs or people that are on contracts that, uh, you know, are um, player options. And uh, the Raptors, they might be in a world of trouble come this offseason if they're not able to, uh, you know, trade some of the players that are on those types of contracts. And, uh, I, I don't know what the heck they're going to do. Like, it's just a mess. Yeah, I I want to believe in Masai, and I want to say that he's going to do this, but he, he and the organization are in a real corner with, with Fred Van Vliet, uh, you, you yeah, know. I think he's one of the ones that has that type of contract where it's a player option. It's not a team option. Yeah, and it's just like you could gonna go. be going to be a, a real discussion we have, and... Over time, we'll, we'll keep you updated. We're not going to get into the minutia of each player today, but there there is going to be that difficult decisions, and that's why Masai gets you know paid the big bucks and Bobby Webster because they've got to figure out the contract situation that they put the team in because at the end of it all, we yeah. do have to recognize that this is the decision that management put everybody in and said right. we're going to give you a player option and you make the decision and right now if i'm if i'm a player uh, for the toronto raptors i i'm out if i'm fred van vliet you know i'm yeah. I, i'm out i'm done i'm moving on to someone that's going to be a championship team in a year or two the toronto raptors are far far away from 
being a yeah i think trent jr is another one that may have a player option i could be incorrect about that but um i think there's two or three uh players that uh, have that and um they just why would a team go and do what they did in regards to um you know trade for portal which i think you know he is a good player and that has helped improve the team uh however like they should have had a fire sale when they had the chance uh at third trade deadline and they didn't and now i think they're going to have a world of hurt because they aren't going to get as much um you know for some of the players but the hope with yaka Pertle was oh we're gonna sign him long term oh, the great weight hope. you know it's it's like and i'm not sure that if i'm yaka Pertle, i'm wanting to sign here long term so it will be very fascinating I, i'm gonna give you an option here I, i'm gonna ask you do you want to talk uh, Nick Nurse and some of the stuff that he said or do you want to get right into the NHL playoffs as we have three Canadian teams uh, vowing Ooh. for Lord Stanley's Cup mm. you're giving me a choice that's very nice of I you. know isn't it it is um, well I think we're probably going to get into uh, the Raptors offseason um, probably in a later topic probably within the next few weeks and um, as the time of recording, it's, you know, the NHL playoffs are uh, starting tonight. So why don't we talk some NHL playoffs and maybe some matchups and what we think? Let's do that. Uh, let's begin uh, out west. There are three Canadian teams uh, vowing for Lord Stanley Cup. If you've been living under a rock, here are your three Canadian teams. The Winnipeg Jets, the Edmonton Oilers, and the Toronto Maple Leafs. Let's start out west. Uh, Winnipeg Jets versus Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, thoughts from you on this series? What say one Cam Jenkins? Well, I think from uh, last year, um, they had the exact same series, and uh, Vegas came out on top. And I think that this year they're going to have Mark Stone. So I th think Vegas is going to pull it out, but I think it's going to go seven games because I think it's going to be a tight series. And you never know with Hellebuck. He's probably one of the best goalies in the league, at least top five, and he can steal a game for you and possibly a series. So I think it's going to be tight, but I'm going to go uh, not Winnipeg's way. Does it? Does it bother you that expansion teams like the Vegas Golden Knights, the Seattle Kraken, which we're not going to get into today, does it bother you that they're having as much success as they are because the design, allegedly, of these teams is that they're supposed to be bad for a number of years? Well, Vegas went to the Stanley Cup Final in their first season, and the Seattle Kraken in their first season have made the playoffs. Does this bother you, or do you like it? No, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, with the Kraken, uh, they went in, in a different direction as far as how they built their team uh, compared to the Vegas Golden Knights. Vegas Golden Knights, they got a lot of contracts. Uh, the GM at the time, it uh, escapes me uh, who that was. George McPhee. Thank you very much. Uh, with George McPhee, um, he was holding everybody hostage in regards to uh, you know the players that uh, people wanted to get rid of in order to be able to you know get draft picks um and when he did that um he's like yeah i'll take your overpriced five million dollar player that's only scoring two goals a year um but i also want two first round draft picks or you know whatever he did and he was able to really build uh that team that way and also get really good players as well um to be able because he had so many first round draft picks and draft picks uh, overall, he was really able to do a good job. Um, Seattle Kraken didn't go that way. Um, they didn't hold a lot of uh, people hostage with the trades that they did make, and they went the draft and uh, development route. So, uh, yeah, it, it's two different ways. Um, but, you know, like if the Kraken, I really enjoyed that they made the playoffs this year, to be quite honest with you, because I feel that they're doing it the right way air yeah. quotes uh, for people listening to us and not on uh, YouTube is w what I just did there. So, yeah, I think the Kraken um, are a good organization and I think they're drafting and developing uh, the right way. And with um, Vegas, they got a lot of unrestricted free agents too. Um, but then when it didn't meet their cap expectations anymore, they just got rid of them. 
So Vegas, they ended up being a team where a lot of people are like they're ruthless. Um, they're only keeping you around for maybe one or two years, and then they're going to just trade you for someone better, which I guess everyone, every team does that. But from what I heard, um, they were just a bit more ruthless than uh, other teams. And Marc-Andre Fleury, I think, is uh, one of those people right there that uh, I'm specifically talking about because with Marc-Andre Fleury, he won the Vesna Trophy and then got traded. Who trades a Vesna Trophy winner? Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, and that was no, the whole situation with his um, Alan Walsh, his agents, and um, because, uh, uh, was it um, a runner? I forget who the other goaltender was, but uh, that's where the other goaltender went in. And then uh, Alan Walsh, he put like a sword through the back of Flurry, or there was some picture of that. Yeah. And yeah, that was just a whole fiasco. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. Like I, I think um, players, they don't necessarily want to go to Vegas as much as they used to. Um, and that's because they just kind of get rid of their players uh, just like that. And um, yeah, and I, I think they're starting to get a, a, a bad reputation. And I think uh, the the novelty of Vegas may have sort of wa- worn off too of like, oh, we're in Vegas, you know. But you're in Vegas to play. You're not in Vegas to do other Vegas things. And I think that novelty has worn off. Uh, quick comments from me in regards to uh, the Winnipeg Jets, Vegas Golden Knights. I'll tell you that they they have Mark Shifley, Nico Niederreiter, Pierre Luc Dubois, Kyle Connor, all, all of those things, all of those pieces that will help them. But the question is, are they going to be consistent enough to beat the Vegas Golden Knights? And I'm thinking not. Another uh, repeat matchup uh, this year, if we look at the Canadian markups matchups, as I speak English, uh, Edmonton Oilers versus. LA Kings, uh, for me, Cameron, there's lots of talent up front here as well for for the Edmonton Oilers. When you think of Connor McDavid, um, all that, he's going to be hard to stop. There's no question about that. Uh, but for me, it's goaltending that's really going to be the question here. And what are we going to get from goaltending? Are you going to get really good goaltending? Are you going to get really crappy goaltending? It remains to be seen. What are your thoughts on this series? Well, Skinner, uh, he's been playing phenomenal for Edmonton all year, and uh, he took the job away from, um, you know, Jack Campbell, uh, who Leaf fans will know, and he's getting paid $5 million for five years. So that's pretty expensive backup that they have right now, Edmonton. (laughs) And uh, if Skinner goes down, I don't have a lot of confidence in Jack Campbell. Um, But on the other side of the uh, uh, center line, you have the LA Kings, and I believe it's Corpus Olive that they have goalie. And uh, since he's joined the team, I think he has over a 920 save percentage. So, you know, I, I think if Corpus Olive can, uh, you know, turn back the clock a bit and be a goaltender like he was in Columbus when he had that uh, great run in the playoffs, I really think that the Kings can win and uh, beat the Edmonton Oilers, um, even if, you know, McDavid goes off because I. You know, the de- defense in uh, Edmonton is better uh, ever since they got Ekholm. Um, but I, I just don't trust the defense of the Edmonton Oilers. And I think that uh, I trust the defense and the goaltending of uh, L.A. a lot more than I do of Edmonton. Uh, we got uh, about four minutes left. I just wanted to ask you quickly about the Toronto Maple Leafs versus Tampa series. But then... Uh, who's under more pressure so let's start with the tampa bay uh toronto series and then out of all the canadian teams who's under the most pressure go on the series uh go on the series wow okay so uh toronto um they loaded up at the deadline uh, the um, uh, lightning uh, they have uh, a few players hurt i uh, don't know how much but they have players hurt um if and i was seeing on um youtube today i forget which uh when I was watching, but if you look at the first game, the lineup that the Leafs had compared to this year, like it is day and night. And it's such a good team this year compared to last year. Like last year you had like, um, 
Akashe, uh, you had uh, Engvall um, on one of the lines. You had Simmons starting. Like the fourth line was horrible for the Leafs last year. They had uh, Simmons. They had um, they traded for a guy. I forget who was on there, but they got him at the deadline. And um, oh, they had the guy. Um, oh, that was with the New York Islanders, but it was also with the Leafs, and he was kind of a tough guy. And his name escapes me, but he was on the fourth line too. So, and if you look at the fourth line that the Leafs have now, like if they don't go <laughs> past this round, I don't know what to say. And I, I think the Leafs will win it. And I said Leafs in five, so I'm going Leafs in five. Um, and then, sorry, Brock, I was so getting agitated with uh, that. Um, w what was your second question? Who's under more pressure? Uh, um, Leafs, oh, Oilers, Leafs. or or uh, oh, he's not even gonna, not Leafs. even giving Winnipeg a sniff nope. at that. He's nope. saying the the Leafs are under the most pressure. I agree Leafs. with you. The Leafs are under the most pressure. If they do not win, there is going to be some big changes. Uh, here's the second question to this: Then, is one series enough for people to keep their jobs? Because let's be real: if they win the one series. Uh, they're matching up against Boston, who set records this season. Record schmeckered. If the Leafs pass the first round and if Boston gets through, they're going to beat Boston too. But they have to get past that first round. And if they do, and if Boston gets through, because I'm predicting Florida will win that series, actually. Ooh. Um, but for Boston, if they do get to the second round and the Leafs do, I predict that the Leafs are going to win that uh, series. So... How far did the Edmonton Oilers go? Did they get to the conference final? Oh, man, a lot of people are um, talking for them to get all the way to the cup, and I just said that uh, L.A. is going to beat them, so I don't think they're going to make it to the cup final. Um, you know, like uh, Minnesota Wild, you might uh, think about them going to the cup final, to be quite honest with you. And then in the East, I guess I said Toronto is going to beat Boston if they meet, but if they don't meet... Um, I think Boston's going to go all the way. If they get past that first round, Boston, um, and the Leafs don't get past Tampa Bay, I think Boston's going all the way to the cup final. So I guess I'm saying uh, Boston, uh, Minnesota Wild. It's uh, been 10 years since the team that has won the league has won the Stanley Cup. And uh, I think this yeah, is sure. going to be another one of those situations. I think if any team can do it, it can be Boston. But will remain to be seen. The NHL playoffs are the hardest ones to win. Playoffs in general are hard to win. So it's going to be a wild ride. And they will have gotten going at the time of this recording. And we'll be chatting with you guys as the time goes on with how this is going to be going. So enjoy them. That is the end of our show for this week. I'd like to thank Cam Jenkins, Jordan Steves. Our regular technical producer is Mark Aflalo. Our podcast coordinator is Ryan Delahanty. Tune in next week because you just never know what happens when you enter the neutral zone. Be safe. Be well. Be well.